Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please find a way to find a seat. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and begin. My name is Taylor McComb. I'm one of the conference organizers. I'm a PhD student here in environmental sciences, studies and policy with the Focal Department of English. And on behalf of my fellow conference organizers, Ailey Baker, Shane Hall, and Lisa Arkin, I'd like to welcome you to the Environmental Studies 2014 Convocation Address. Uh, I'm going to do a quick bit of business, and then I'm going to turn this over to Professor um, Alan Dickman, who is going to then introduce Professor Tyrone Hayes, and we'll get on with our evening. Uh, we have an amazing talk in store tonight, and this is one of many events that Dr. Prof Professor Hayes is taking part in uh, throughout the weekend, today and tomorrow. Uh, this morning he was part of the City Club of Eugene uh, presentation. He was also on a fantastically fascinating panel with Dr. Um, Kari Norgard and Dr. Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Reese, uh, talking about the notion of intersex in the chemical age. Um, tomorrow we'll be taking part in a bus uh, trip out to Triangle Lake to deal with the contentious and uh, controversial issue of herbicides in a situation that's decentered from the university. So going out to the area, speaking with residents who've been affected by herbicide spraying, and speaking with residents who maybe don't necessarily see a problem quite yet with it. Um, what I would like to do now is briefly explain how we're going to be handling question and answers. We have a hard <coughs> stop this evening at 8.45. We need to be able to leave then. So in order to make sure that all of our uh, questions are answered in a timely fashion, we're going to do the following. As you came in, you were given a note card. That note card not only guaranteed you a seat, but it also allowed you a place to, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, it also allowed you to uh, write your question down. And this is how we're going to do that. Because we are so uh, short on time, we want to make sure that the questions are done in the most timely and concise manner. So during, your, uh, during the talk, if you have a question, you are all seated at desks. There's little desks that flip up. You can use those to write, or you can write on the back of your neighbor's head. And you can use those to write your questions on it. At the end of Professor Hayes' talk, we will, you will hold up your uh, hand or card, otherwise make some mention of it, get our attention. One of these people will come around, pick up your questions. They'll bring your question down onto me, and I will then ask that question of Professor Hayes. The reason we're doing this is because we want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to answer a question, and we can answer those questions as quickly and efficiently as possible. If it looks like there are more questions than we'll be able to answer, I'm going to do my best to pick some questions that represent a wide variety of perspectives. So, before I introduce Professor Alan Dickman, I need to take a moment to thank our numerous, numerous sponsors. We have incredible support for this event in bringing Dr. Hayes uh, out, and this is really a testament to his work and the issue at large. So, I have to return to my notes because there are many. Professor Hayes' event tonight is sponsored by the Environmental Studies Program, the Oregon Humanities Center, the Hill Fund, the Department of Biology, the Department of Chemistry, the Environmental Science Institute, the Institute for Ecology and Evolution, the Center for Women, the Study of Women and Society, the Department of Philosophy, CARE, the Coalition Against Environmental Racism, the Environmental Humanities Research Interest Group, Professor David Vasquez of the English and Ethnic Studies Department, and of course with our community partner, Lisa Arkin and Beyond Toxics. Uh, Beyond Toxics has a table that you saw on your way out. If you're interested in getting more information about that or being involved in any of their events, please see them. I should also mention that we have still a few student spots available for our trip out to Triangle Lake tomorrow. If you are interested and you are a student and you would like to participate in that event and talk to people who are affected by these issues and talk about ways of potentially acting upon what you're hearing about tonight and what you may be experiencing tomorrow, please come see me after the event and I'll get down your information and we can make sure that you get registered for that. Finally, I must, must, must thank and acknowledge the work of Radana Imong, Gayla Wardwell, and Allison Mildrexer of the Environmental Studies Department. They are geniuses and they are miracle workers, and without, this, without them, none of this would have happened. So I would like to thank them now. Yes. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Professor Alan Dickman who is the Director of Environmental Studies and the Research Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and Biology. Professor Thanks, Dickman. Steve. Thanks. Good evening and welcome. It's great to see you all here. Um, several years ago, some faculty in the Environmental Studies program thought that it would be nice to 
have a way to celebrate the program, the beginning of the year, advertise our mission, nurture the, nurture the community by having a meaningful event near the beginning of the academic year that would bring an outside speaker in um, and we'd invite faculty, students, and community to come together to learn, to discuss, and to work on an environmental issue that was of interest to many of the people in the program. And we decided to call these things convocations. So convocation means both the summoning of people to come as well as the event that you're here for tonight. This is the 2014 Environmental Studies Program convocation. Someone referred to these as semi-annual events, by which I think uh, w was not meant that they happen twice a year, but it meant that they happen every year if we got around to it or uh, somebody had the energy to put it on or something wonderful fell in our lap. Um, so when the primary organizers of this event, um, Shane Hall, Taylor McComb, Ailey Baker, came to see me um, a couple of months ago, I think it was, late in the summer, and asked if environmental studies would help support the event financially and logistically, um, I asked them to tell me, you know, what it was about. And I'm going to read this because I, I'll be true to the spirit of that conversation, but the details might be, you know, not quietly precise. But they said something like this. We envision an event around the complicated and interdisciplinary issues of herbicides and health that would attract students, faculty, and community members, and which would be a high-profile event for our program that would be a good way to kick off the academic year, or something like that. And I said, well, that sounds like convocation, and I'd be really happy to help support that. And they said, what's convocation? And I knew that at least two of them had been here for more than three years. And so I realized that um, it's probably um, time to re-engage this annual event. And I'm really, really grateful to uh, the three of you, Shane, Taylor, and Ailey, for all you've done to make this uh, come together. So we need to thank them. They're the ones who did it. So, um, the Environmental Studies website proudly proclaims that our program trains leaders in creative problem solving, critical thinking, and responsible citizenship. Environmental Studies is the largest and most interdisciplinary program on this campus. With 24 core faculty and over 100 affiliated faculty, we draw from professional schools like architecture and allied arts, business, education, journalism, law, as well as from the three major divisions within the College of Arts and Sciences, the natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. So if there are faculty here who are affiliated with, in any way with environmental studies, would you either stand or wave uh, to the audience? Great. Thank you. Um, thanks for your interest and your participation, and thank you for being here tonight. Our program currently has a dozen doctoral students and about twice that many master's students, and their interests are as broad-ranging as those of our faculty. Our current doctoral students have primary research areas that are aligned with the fields of biology, economics, English, geography, sociology, and philosophy. We've recently added a graduate specialization in food studies. So would all the graduate students who are somehow affiliated with environmental studies wave, say hello tonight? Cool. Nice. Thank you for your participation and for being here. We have about 600 undergraduate majors pursuing a degree in either environmental studies or environmental science. And whichever of those two majors, they all take courses in natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities, and they do a practical learning experience as part of their major. We also have a minor in environmental studies, and we hope to add soon a minor in food studies. So um, are there undergraduates here that are affiliated with the environmental studies program? Would you say hi? Great. Welcome. And thank you for being here. Um, we have graduate alumni dating back to 1986. That was our first, our first graduate alumna in 1986. And I just counted that in the last decade, we have produced more than 100 um, master's um, degrees um, in our program. Many of these students work in government agencies uh, for nonprofits um, or in education. Um, 
Graduates of our doctoral program hold faculty positions at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, the Evergreen State College, Oberlin College, Humboldt State University, Oregon Institute of Technology, Villanova University, Ursinus College, and Yale University. Our undergraduate alumni hold positions in a wide variety of fields, including environmental planning, environmental education, green investment planning, wildlife biology, uh, REI, local restaurants, and a lot of others. <laughs> So, if there are any alumni of the Environmental Studies program here tonight, would you say hi? Yay. And finally, we view our friends and supporters in the community as important parts of our program. Um, maybe some of you have hosted an intern, or maybe you've made financial donations to the program, or maybe you're hoping to do that tonight. You can see me afterward. Or maybe you're just interested in our shared mission of training leaders in creative problem solving, critical thinking, and responsible citizenship. And to all of you, I say thanks for your interest and participation and for being here tonight. So now, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Tyrone Hayes is a professor of integrative biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Named an emerging explorer by National Geographic, Professor Hayes studies the role of steroid hormones in amphibian development, and he's published scores of peer-reviewed articles on related research. His work seeks to explain how changes in the external environment relate to changes in organisms' internal development and systems. He's internationally known for his intensive, extensive research into the effects that exposure to the herbicide atrazine have on amphibians. His work, along with that of his colleagues and implications their work have for human health, have created national attention and controversy within academia and beyond. Professor Hayes' research and public activism were recently the subject of a New Yorker magazine article which documented how many people have accused the herbicide's creator, Syngenta, of organizing targeted efforts to discredit Professor Hayes' work. Some academics some academics are hesitant to engage in contentious public debates, but Professor Hayes has not shied away from the controversy his findings have engendered. In fact, to say that he gives regular public discussions is a great understatement, demonstrating his dedication not only to scientific inquiry, but to broad-based community education as well. So we're here tonight to learn about research and engagement that lie at the intersections of biology, chemistry, public policy, business, and ethics. These interdisciplinary connections are central to the mission and methods of environmental studies, and we're honored to be able to showcase the exemplary work and experience of Professor Hayes to our students and to the wider community. Professor Hayes' lecture tonight is titled, From Silent Spring to Silent Night of Toads and Men. I don't know if I gave something away that I wasn't supposed to there. Um, <laughs> The lecture will explode, explore some of his research. Sorry, that was a bad slip. The consequence of that research <laughs> and discuss the need for science and active involvement of the public and policy decisions which connect herbicides and health. Please help me give a warm welcome to Professor. Um, so I have a story to tell you tonight, but before I tell you this story, Silent Spring to Silent Night, this tale of toads and men, I want to share with you a proverb that I learned while working in Southern Africa, which roughly translates into people are people through other people. So I never present myself unless I first acknowledge and thank the people that have made me the person that I am. Uh, first and foremost, my family. This is an old family portrait. They won't let me be in them anymore. <laughs> not sure why. Uh, but especially my mom and my dad. I'm a biologist. I literally wouldn't be here without my mom and my dad, Romeo and Susie Hayes. And then to my wife, Catherine, and my daughter, Casina, and my son, Tyler. I have an older picture that I want to share of them, too. These, this, these are their prom pictures. And I share that because it exemplifies the relationship we had. I don't know which made me prouder, that my son borrowed my tie for his prom or that my daughter borrowed my earrings for her prom. I, 
They both. After 18 years of telling her, no, daddy's earrings are too grown up for you, she finally got to go in my closet. I also want to thank my funding sources. I, I've been working on Atrazine for, geez, a little over 10 years now, and it's, it's, it's taken a lot of finances to get through the work. And in particular, this is also my disclosure, because I have been funded by the chemical industry, Novartis and Syngenta. But as you may know, they've since decided they don't really like hanging out with me. <laughs> and that's OK with me. I also want to thank all of the students that have been involved. And in particular, I want to point out that everybody in blue is an undergraduate. I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate myself, and so I'm trying my best to give that back now that I'm in a position to do so. And this is my current lab. There are actually some men in it. They just didn't show up for the photograph. So. <laughs> and finally, I want to dedicate this to my grandmother. Um, among other things, my grandmother, who was like a third parent to me, taught me, passed on to me before she passed on her love of education and her desire to make the world a better place through education. Um, she also taught me something very important. She taught me that if you want to get a point across, don't preach, don't lecture, don't give talks, just tell a good story. So I'm just going to tell you a good story today. I, I know you've already heard, you already have some expectations that I'm controversial. Controversial surrounds UO speaker, biology professors, a favorite. This is in the newspaper here. So I, I'll try to tell you when this becomes controversial. I'm not, I'm not really sure. My story starts, though, before it was controversial. <laughs> my story starts and will end with a little boy who likes frogs. I've been in love with frogs for as long as I can remember. My mom, for example, sent this book to me when my son was born. And she wrote a note in there that said, this was your dad's favorite book. I don't remember the book, but my mama don't lie. She says, this was my favorite book. It was my favorite book. I remember, though, the love of frogs. I remember trying to answer this question for as long as I can remember. And I remember being at this place, which I'm going to share with you. This is my grandmother's house. She was born in that house. It's a plywood, tin roof house. She was born in that house. My mom was born in that house. Her grandfather built the house. And to give you an idea of how connected she was to that house, the bill of sale for my gr grandmother's grandmother, who was born a slave, was still in the house when my grandmother passed. But what's important for this story is I spent the weekends there. And behind their house, you can see there, was a huge forest. And I would wander through that forest. I would get lost for hours filming birds or chasing snakes or catching frogs. And now, through Google Earth, I can share that forest with you. <laughs> There's the house. That's it. That was the whole thing. The cemetery was always there. The highways were always there. And that was a horse pasture. But I remember it being this giant, vast, <laughs> Amazon thing, <laughs> and that's all it was. But it had a huge impact on me. I chased these things, and I know there are some young people in the audience, so I should have warned you. Um, this is just one of the cool things about frogs, is that they're very altruistic. You see, this frog here has hurt its leg, and this one's nice enough, <laughs> nice enough to give it a ride home. Just one of the many cool things. I, that's not controversial, right? We're still in the there's an there's a inappropriate joke I could tell about what happens when you help a friend, but I won't. <laughs> they lay eggs on the way. I'll let you figure out the punchline. But they lay these eggs. And it, what's interesting about these were wood frogs is there's about 2,000 eggs here that each female lays, but hundreds of females might lay their eggs in these communal clutches. And what this creates is the environmental or temperature gradient where the eggs in the middle can be as much as 10 degrees warmer and the eggs on the edge. And this fascinated me because this meant that the ones in the middle might grow faster, they might develop faster, they might metamorphose faster. And what's more is, it might affect the sex ratio. So I did some dissections. I was interested in the sex ratio. So here's male. You're going to see a lot of gonads tonight. Here's testes, and these are ovaries. And then I was interested in how the environment shaped development, but also what kind of boundaries the genes put on that uh, uh, ability of the environment to manipulate development. So I looked for sex chromosomes. Turns out frogs don't have them. And here's where we're at in the story now. If you're thinking, gee, we flew this guy all the way up here to show us bad slides. That's because these are from my undergraduate thesis at Harvard. And young people, this is back where cut and paste literally meant cut and paste. You had to cut it out. You had to paste it on the page. This is a page from my senior honors thesis. There I am at age 19. I'm like younger than my kids. Well, you know what I mean. 
There's my professor. And, and there's Laura, who I'm guessing went on to do something else, because she doesn't quite look as excited as I was <laughs> to be in a swamp at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but it meant a huge amount to me. Now, the other thing that has been with me since I was a child was I dreamed of going to Africa. I, I remember my father would bring home these National Geographic magazines, and I would fold out the magazines, and I would dream of going to this magical place. Truly a dream. My father made $9,000 a year for a family of five. First time I ever got on an airplane was when I went to college. So it was out of the realm of possibility. Except, now here's where we're at in my story. I'm a graduate student. Not controversial yet. I got to go to Africa. Not only did I get to go, National Geographic paid for it. I got to be in the magazine. I got to be in the movie. I got to do a Toyota commercial. I literally, I got to wear this beard. I literally, <laughs> I literally became that guy that I dreamed about as a little kid. It was as true to a dream come true as you can possibly imagine. Now things get a little weird. So I'm working in Africa. I'm a, I'm a graduate student now, about to finish my PhD. And I'm working in a place called the Arabuku Sukoke. And one of the cool things about working in Africa is you get to say words like Arabuku Sukoke. <laughs> and so I'm working in the Arabuku Sukoke, and I, and I discover this frog. And what's interesting about this frog, Hyperolius largus, is that the males and the females look completely different. This is the kind of thing that fascinates a little boy who likes frogs. So I wanted to know how they became to look so different. So just a real simple question. So I brought these frogs back. See, now we had Adobe Photoshop, so cut and paste is a lot nicer. This is the same frog once a, photographed once a day for six days. And what we discovered was that they all start out green. But then the females change color at sexual maturity, at puberty. So we hypothesized then that it's probably estrogen. The same reason that girls grow breasts at puberty, our frog reaches puberty, and estrogen won't make it grow breasts, but it'll make it change color. And then we did, we do real simple experiments sometimes to answer big questions. You know what we did? We just dipped the frogs in hormones, like literally. And then we showed that testosterone didn't do anything, but if you dip them in estrogen, they would change color. Ah, it was really neat. Now, here's where it gets weird. <laughs> just in case you were wondering. Here's a species, Hyperolis argus. And on February 15th, 1993, I remember the date because it's the day before my son was born. I was given this talk at UC Davis, and my wife goes into labor. My son was born the next day. And we're driving down the highway to get back to Oakland, where my son was born. And my wife says, between contractions, you should patent that frog. And I thought it was like crazy hormones or something. I said, well, you can't patent the frog. And she called her brother, and he said, oh, yeah, you can patent a frog. Here, too, for the... He's a lawyer. And so we did. We called it the Hyperolis Argus Endocrine Screen, or the Haze Test. <laughs> here's, and here's why you patent the frog. So here's a control, an unexposed animal. They all start out green. If you give them, if you dip them in estradiol, the estrogen that's in every sexually mature female, it doesn't matter if you're a fish, a dog, a cat, a human, a frog, or a hog, if you're a sexually mature female, you have estradiol in your blood. Ethanyl estradiol is the estrogen that's used in birth control pill, a synthetic. It causes them to change color. DES, which some of we uh, heard someone talking about earlier today, a very potent pharmaceutical estrogen, it makes them change color. And DDT is not a hormone, not an estrogen, but it binds the estrogen receptor and mimics estrogen and makes them change color. So we discovered, I worked with an undergraduate and a graduate student, we discovered after screening dozens of compounds that every compound that made my frog change color was also known to promote breast cancer. So we had this little frog, they're about the size of your pinky nail, we could raise them by the thousands and we could test chemicals and determine if they might promote breast cancer. We could also test water. You could send me your water, get my frog, and it'd be like, hey, you might want to get a British filter. <laughs> what else we discovered was that if we treat them with tamoxifen first, we could block the color change. And tamoxifen is the drug that blocks estrogen that's used to treat breast cancer. So we could screen new drugs. So my wife had an MBA and an MPH. We thought we'd set up a little mom and pop shop, make a little lettuce on the side, right? Screening compounds. Then, little boy who likes frogs gets introduced to the term intellectual property. The university says, oh, it's a good idea, but show us you're gonna make money on it or we're gonna sell it. So I get my first customer, now here's where it gets weird. It hasn't gotten controversial yet, it's just weird. Novartis, the largest chemical company in the world, comes and says, we want you to test atrazine. 
I had never heard of atrazine. Now we're joined at the carbon bond. You Google atrazine, you get Tyrone. You Google Tyrone, you get atrazine. <laughs> it's an herbicide used on corn mostly, but in Oregon it's mostly used in forestry. It's been used since 1958. We use 80 million pounds a year in the United States. At the time, it was the number one selling pesticide in the world. It's used in more than 80 countries, but now it's outlawed in all of Europe. And now this slide is actually a lie. Syngenta's lawyers say it has not been outlawed in all of Europe. It has been denied regulatory approval. <laughs> I'm not sure what it, maybe that's the controversial part. I'm not sure what the difference is, but I know that this one pisses them off, so that's the slide that I use, because <laughs> that's just the kind of brother I am. <laughs> so what they asked me to do, they said, we want you to use Xenopus, another African frog, the African clawed frog. Who's, who's ever heard or seen Xenopus? Everybody uses it. It's, a really, it's like the lab rat for amphibians. And but actually, who knows why? Everybody uses Xenopus. There's an interesting story. Turns out in 1920, somebody discovered that the human pregnancy hormone, HCG, will make this frog lay eggs. So by 1940, this was the pregnancy test. If you thought you were pregnant, you would go to the doctor, they would inject some urine into the frog, and the frog laid eggs. You were either happy or sad, depending on your situation. <laughs> now, I share that story for a couple reasons. There are three important reasons that I share that story. One is, it shows you the value of curiosity-based research. This was the pregnancy test. But imagine before that, some guy, some guy sat down and said, you know, I wonder what'll happen if I inject pee into a frog. Like, how do, you, how do you come up with that? How do you discover something like that? I have no idea. The second reason I share it is because it shows you, just like my frog, that the hormones in us are so similar that the estrogens that promote breast cancer in humans make my frogs change color and vice versa. And our pregnancy hormone is so similar to this frog's hormone that it will make this frog lay eggs. The third significance of the story is they developed new pregnancy tests and people just threw the frogs out. So you can actually collect them in San Diego and San Francisco for free instead of paying lots of money to purchase them. So I guess technically that makes my frogs African-American clawed frogs, but that's a, a minor <laughs> detail that doesn't affect the outcome of the results. So here's the first thing we discovered. The company was paying us, and we discovered that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box or the larynx. Now that's bad news. That's bad news because male frogs sing and female frogs don't for the same reason that men have deeper voices than women, because of testosterone. So these data implied that their testosterone wasn't doing so well. So we ran a check, and we dissected animals that had been exposed. And you see here the kidneys. But this is an animal with two testes, two ovaries, another testes. More. This frog could hurt his leg and give itself a ride home. There's a whole <laughs> party going on there, which is not normal. Now, I learned some valuable lessons earlier today about language. And by not normal, I don't mean that it's no kind of judgment. I mean that frogs do not normally develop as hermaphrodites. And I make that point because for years I'd give this talk, and somebody would always say, aren't frogs naturally hermaphroditic? And who knows why people think that? Jurassic Park, yeah. It took me years to figure. So in Jurassic Park, it was frog DNA that made the dinosaurs change sex. And everybody seems to have remembered that. So you, anyway, that's science fiction. There are fish that are naturally have both male and female gonads, but not frogs. Frogs are not. I also put it up because the company was trying to convince people that it was a natural phenomenon and I was making a big deal out of nothing. Maybe that's controversial. So here's what we proposed. Imagine that this is your testicle. Actually, you guys are playing Berkeley tonight, right? So imagine this is somebody from Berkeley football player's testicle, because we're going to mess with it. You should make testosterone if you're a male. The word testosterone literally means testicular hormone. Testicular hormone, two words stuck together, like twist and jerk, you get twerk. Testicular hormone, you get testosterone. <laughs> The hypothesis was that when you're exposed to atrazine, it turns on aromatase. I want you to remember aromatase. We're going to talk about it a lot. It's the enzyme, it's the machinery, if you will, that converts testosterone into estrogen. The word estrogen literally means generator of estrus. It's the female hormone. The result is, and I've simplified things a little bit, but essentially you run out of testosterone, so you're demasculinized, your larynx doesn't grow, but you're also feminized because now you're making estrogen, 
which is okay if you're female, maybe not so okay if you're a male. And so we tested that, uh, at least the first part of it. We measured testosterone, and these are daytime levels when these males, controlled or unexposed males compared to atrazine-treated males compared to females. And so indeed, they had very, very low testosterone levels. Now let's, let me tell you where we're at in our story right now. Now I'm coming up for tenure. So I'm a, you know, I, my hype reel is Argus, got me a job, now I'm an assistant professor, I'm coming up for tenure, and we published this paper, you can see here, hermaphroditic demasculinized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. Published it in PNAS, Proceedings to National Academy of Sciences. You guys know the big deal, right? Coming up for tenure, got a PNAS paper, I called my mom. I talked to my mom every Sunday. I said, Mom, it's a 100% true story, I don't make this stuff up. I said, Mom, I have a paper coming out in PNAS. Silence. I said, Mom, did you hear me? She said, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out how you get a paper cut on your penis. I said, no, no, no. I said, P-N, and she said, you ain't got to spell it. I used to change your diaper, so. It's a 100% true story. My mom calls me back the next Sunday. My mom says, how important was that magazine article you were talking about? I said, what do you mean, mom? She said, I went to Barnes and Noble, and they never heard of no P-N. And <laughs> I'm going to come back to that in a minute. That was an incredibly important experience for me. Now this is my most important publication. It's a book written for fifth graders. That's Casino the Frog. My daughter was named after on the front. And my mom can buy it in Barnes and Noble. I'll tell you why that's important when we get to the end of my story. Well, we're not at the end of my story yet. I'm not dead, but we get to the end of this part. So this was important for my tenure. Well, in fact, you know, I forgot to mention, there were also four black men and a Latina co-op. That's probably a record for the National Academy publication. Something I'm very proud of. As important as it was, however, there were a lot of questions left. One, we didn't know if these males were, were hermaphrodites, if the hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes. That sounds like an easy question to answer, but I discovered as an undergraduate that frogs don't have sex chromosomes. So we couldn't tell. We had a good idea, because if we treated a batch of frogs, 50% would be female, 30% might be male, 20% might be hermaphrodite. So we had a good idea it was the, female, or the males that were being affected. But the other thing we didn't know is what happens when they become adults, which sounds like an easy question to answer, except that it takes these frogs about four years, four or five years, to become sexually mature. So you got to get an undergraduate and go, hey, hey, I got a project for you, and maybe by the time you graduate, we'll have an answer. In fact, it was worse than that. It took us eight years to fully solve the problem. But I was in no hurry. I had tenure. Here's the answer. This is a second PNAS paper coming up, the more recent one. After eight years of raising these guys, you see that guy there? They hurt their legs all the time. You'd be amazed. Looks like he's smiling. By the time the paper came out, a gene had been discovered by our colleagues that only females have, called DMW. So we could actually tell genetically who was male and who was female. Males only have one band. So Smiley there, he's a male. That's his brother. So it turns out about 10% of the males in this population completely turn into females. They lay eggs and everything. If we didn't have the molecular tools, the genetics, we wouldn't know that he wasn't, or, uh, sorry, we wouldn't know that he wasn't a, a female. But his genome, his genes, don't, don't match his morphology. He's actually a grandmother now, by the way. Now, I could have published that. That's, that's the pretty stuff. Males turn it into female. I could have published that, but I was in no hurry. I already had tenure. And what I wanted to know is, those other 90% of the males that don't turn into females, I wanted to know if they were sexually competent. I wanted to know what the deal with those. So I wanted to know if they could reproduce. The problem is, frogs reproduce in the spring. And apparently so do undergraduates. So you gotta, everybody wants to go away to some pool party, spring break thing. So I made a deal. And there's some undergraduates in the audience, right? I made a deal in 2008. I said, look, if you stay here and do some work, I will give you a pool party. You can have everything. You do that, right? You have your spring break. I mean, Snoop Dogg wasn't going to come to my pool party, but you got the spring break, pool party, and a PNAS publication, potentially. Yeah. So it went something like this. <laughs> this was our apparatus. We literally, we did this, like, simple things, right? So we literally, we put four females in there. We put four unexposed males and four atrazine treated males. And I know guys are like, that's not the ratio I want at the club. But the idea is the females are limiting, so the males have to compete. So we literally 
we call these pool parties. So we literally put them in there at 7 p.m. And then, the, and then the lights go out, and then the lights come back on in the morning, and then you just look at who got the hookup. So there's like little threads on there so we can tell who's who and identify them. And if you do this experiment, real simple, we did it four times. Everybody was a virgin. Nobody was tested twice. And when you do that, you find that the atrazine-treated males almost never win, almost never. So we were kind of on to something. What's more is, so imagine you're at a club. The lights come on. There's somebody going around writing down names about who hooked up. And then they stick a needle in your heart and take a blood sample. That's how, that's how this went down. <laughs> so when you do that, as you might guess, the control males have on average more testosterone than the atrazine-treated male. But what's more significant is if you look at who made the love connection, the individual data, there's almost like a cutoff where either females don't like you or you're getting beat up, who knows. But these atrazine-treated males just don't have enough testosterone to be competitive. So I could have published that, but I had tenure. I was in no hurry. I wanted to know where these males capable once they were exposed. So then we did something that I call the Motel 6 experiments. <laughs> In this case, we just got them a room, no competition, and said, put them with the female, left them overnight, and then looked at their fertility. So we'd get a batch of eggs. There's about 2,000 there. That one's not fertilized, so it didn't hatch. These are fertile. So yeah, there's an undergraduate sitting there going, one, two, three. <laughs> Real complex. But you find out that the control males, while fertilizing about 85% of a female's eggs, the atrazine-treated male is only about 15%. So they're not competent or capable or competent. They don't fertilize eggs for two reasons. One, they don't even try. They just sit there and watch the females lay eggs. No competition. They're all alone. They just sit there and watch. They're not interested. The other thing is if you look at their testes under the microscope, so these are thin slices of testes, what you find out, it, it, you guys do statistics. You guys like p-values. Me too. But you know what I like even more? when I can see what's happened. And you can see the difference, right? What's happening here is these are testicular tubules full of, full of sperm. And what you see in these atrazine-treated animals are testicular tubules that have cellular debris. They don't have enough testosterone to make sperm. They don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior. So now I published that. We published a, we put this in PNAS as well. Atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration in male Africa. Yeah, the company don't like that word. That, that's why I put it in the title. <laughs> that's the kind of brother I have. <laughs> What's, what else is important here is that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven undergraduates co-authored that paper. And all of them now have either an MD or a PhD, 100%. And one of my graduate students, a Morehouse man, was also on there, We're also very proud of. Now, the next question we asked was whether or not these effects occur in other species of frogs. Maybe African clawed frogs are just weird. So we looked at the North American leopard frog, and this is a paper that we published in Nature, another one of those magazines that my mama can't get. And we showed these are testes, and then you see all this junk in the trunk? These are eggs that are bursting through the surface of this male's testes. Now, at this stage, I was interacting with the Environmental Protection Agency. Maybe that's the controversial part. So I, ca I called them up, and I broke a rule of nature. I sent them the data before it was published. I couldn't have my paper kicked out. And, 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 I, and I remember the EPA, they emailed me back, and they said, well, thank you, Dr. Hayes. This is a very interesting finding. However, we do not think it is an adverse effect that would trigger reassessment and regulation of the chemical. <laughs> uh, it was, in fact, the Bush administration. And to go back to 1993, I remember my wife tells me there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth. I'm, I'm going to have to give her that. But I would guess that a dozen chicken eggs in my testicles. <laughs> right, guys? It would have to be in the top five. <laughs> the EPA says, nope, it's not in the book. Keep spraying atrazine. <laughs> I don't know. So, then we wanted to ask, do these effects occur in the field? Is this a laboratory artifact, or is this a real life thing we have to worry about? So to give you an idea, because you don't know, of the levels we're talking about, we're using atrazine to produce those effects at 0.1 parts per billion. That's 0.1 micrograms per mil. That's 100 nanograms, uh, sorry, 0.1 micrograms per liter. That's like 
That's like one one thousandth of a grain of salt in two liters. It's like nothing. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, the package of atrazine recommends application at 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. So a typical farmer is applying this stuff at levels that are 290 million times higher than we're using. Yeah. Here's the minimum and maximum in agricultural runoff. Here's the minimum and maximum in temporary pools. And this is from the literature, not my work. This is permanent water. Here's precipitation. Here's the level that we're using. Here's all the habitats that would be at risk. There's enough atrazine in rainwater to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frogs. In rainwater, a half million pounds of atrazine come down in the rainwater every year. So even if you're not using it in an area where it's used, it can travel 1,000 kilometers. The USGS guy named Perry Jones said they can measure it in rainwater in Minnesota from when people apply it in Kansas. And that's why the European Union got rid of it, because France banned it and Germany was still using it. It was still coming down in their water. What's more is here's the drinking water stand at three parts per billion. So drinking water can have 30 times the atrazine that we know to be biologically active. In fact, I'll tell you a story. The environmental Health and Safety, they wrote to me, and they said, well, we're concerned about these experiments, Dr. Hayes. What are you going to do with the wastewater after your experiment? <laughs> right? I, I wrote back, I said, well, I'm going to take it home and drink it. Because it's guaranteed to have... See, I thought it was funny, too. Those, those EH&S guys, though, not so much. So we did this study. Here's a kidney. Here's the gonads. This is now an animal from the wild. And, and I'm going to slice it up and show you what it looks like under the microscope. So just imagine I'm slicing a salami and folding out a slice. The stain's different because of the color of stain we use under the microscope. And, and I'll blow this up again. I'll blow this. See, there's a testicular tubule. And see, those are eggs or oocytes. I call them testicular oocytes when I published it. The company got upset. They said, that's not a word. I said, I went to Harvard. I can make up a word. <laughs> and now it's a word. They get really upset when I make up words for some reason. I'm not sure why. But you know, I keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of brother I am. So here's what we did in the study. Red is where there's highest atrazine use down to, down to white. And we control for latitude. We did a study where we, and I'm just, I'm being obnoxious. This is Highway I-80. And we were driving to a meeting in Indiana. <laughs> And we collected frogs on the way and got a nature paper. That's fuel efficiency right there. So it turns out that everywhere we found atrazine, we found feminized frogs and vice versa. And the reason this got published in a, in a competitive journal like Nature is because we, we had more than just the, the correlational data. We could also have lab data where we could take animals from here and raise them in clean water and show that they didn't become feminized. Or we could take animals from here, here sorry, we take animals from here and raise them in atrazine water and show that they're feminized. Or we could take animals from here and raise them in clean water and show that they're not feminized. In other words, it wasn't just geographic variation. It was associated, and we could show that experimentally, with atrazine exposure. So now I'm going to switch up a little bit. We did some stuff after this on pesticide mixtures and immune function. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to tell you about that part of my adventure. I hope that wasn't the controversial part. But what we did now, uh, what I want to talk to you about now is sort of the broader implications. So this is a photograph I took at a place called Lake Nabugabo in Uganda. Again, you get to say cool names like Nabugabo. And what it's showing is that the runoff from this crop in these containers is the sole source of drinking, cooking, bathing water for this nearby village. And I show this because I want to illustrate the oneness of environmental health and public health. It, they're not related. They're not connected. There's really just one piece that we need to talk about. The problem is, and here's my village. I live somewhere there. Uh, the problem is my water just comes from there. But we have these fancy agencies, which Uganda doesn't have, and we make these assumptions that there's nothing bad in our water. And I don't really think that's the case. So I call this from silent spring to silent night. Because in much the same way that Rachel Carson taught that the death of birds and the role of pesticides were playing was a warning to us, I think that our new canary in the coal mine and the pending silent night is also a warning to us. For those of you who don't know, 70% of all amphibians globally are in decline. 70% of all species. A class of animals that survived the mass extinction of the dinosaurs are now disappearing at a rate faster than the dinosaurs disappeared from the Earth. That's just a fact. A colleague of mine wrote in Echoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. 
what I'm going to tell you about now, in part because Syngenta likes to go around saying, well, it's just this crazy guy from Berkeley and frogs. Atrazine is not really a problem. I may very well be a crazy guy from Berkeley, but atrazine is a problem. I'm going to tell you about studies in fish that show the same thing that my work has shown. I'm going to tell you studies from birds and reptiles, and I'm going to tell you about studies in mammals, including humans, that show similar types of effects as we've shown in amphibians. I know this because I emailed, I'm an email and fool, I emailed everybody in the world who works on atrazine, people I had never heard of, and I said, let's write a paper together. And while, I hope I don't offend anybody, but while people, academics, won't necessarily take action and go testify to the EPA, if you give them the chance to get a publication, they'll, they'll readily accept that kind of invitation. <laughs> uh, academics. So 22 of us, this is the first paper we published. We all got together. I had never met from 12 different countries. And we wrote a paper showing the effects of atrazine on reproductive development across vertebrate classes. I, I made up the word gonadotoxin in this one. I pissed them off. But you know, <laughs> that's the kind of brother I am. <laughs> Don't know how to be any different. So here's the kinds of things we discovered. Here's frogs. Remember my frog? Sperm in the testis, give him atrazine, no sperm. This is a guy in Belgium. Fish. Sperm in the testis, give him atrazine, no sperm. This is a, uh, a couple working down in Argentina. This is a caiman. It's like a big alligator, a reptile. Sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, looks like my frog. This is a guy, our studies that were done in both Croatia and in uh, Nigeria. That's a testicular tubule, full of sperm. Feed the rats atrazine, no sperm. And this is a guy in Pakistan, sperm in the testis of a bird, quail, give it atrazine, no sperm. So this effect is occurring across vertebrate classes, not just frogs. I, you know, I may still be a crazy guy from Berkeley, but independent scientists around the world are now discovering the same thing that we reported on. What's more is, I told you that there's no sperm because the atrazine reduces testosterone. Okay? Here are data from fish. This is a guy in England. Atrazine knocks out testosterone. Here's my data in frogs. This is actually Syngenta's data in rats, showing that atrazine significantly decreases testosterone. So it's more than one population, more than one species, more than one genera, more than one family, more than one order. Every class of vertebrates that's been examined is showing the same thing. Now here's a study by Shauna Swan, a colleague of mine in 2003, looked at men in Columbia, Missouri, and showed that there's a significant correlation between atrazine in your urine and low sperm count and inability to get your wife pregnant. Now, you might notice these men have 0.1 parts per billion atrazine on average in their urine. They have enough atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate a frog or a fish, and they have a low sperm count. Hmm, imagine that. So now here's another colleague. I squashed the data down. Because here's a colleague in California looking at atrazine levels in field workers, and I'll squash that down. Because here are the applicators, 2,400 parts per billion. Men who apply atrazine have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we know is associated with low fertility. Men who apply atrazine have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we use to chemically castrate fish and frogs. Imagine this. We could take one of these guys and have them pee in a bucket. We could dilute their urine 24,000 times and use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles. And we know nothing about the health of these men because 90% are Mexican, Mexican-American. In many cases, many of the migrant farm worker groups have life expectancies of 50. One of the things I forgot to say is many of my students, my undergraduates, several of them have come from areas where their families are migrant farm workers or work in agriculture. So many of my students have actually been directly exposed to the chemicals that we're studying. Now here's where I'm at in my story. I'm just a little boy who likes frogs. But now, I'm a full professor by now, and I'm starting to think about things. Yeah, see, that's when you get to be controversial, when you're full. But I'm starting to think about things like environmental justice. I just like frogs, but now I'm thrown into this weird world. Cal consider California, for example. And I'm usually not on the West Coast when I give this talk. So you may know some facts about California. You may know that we're the fifth largest economy in the world. If California were its own country, we'd be the fifth richest country in the world. Why? Agriculture. One in 10 jobs are in ag. 30% of the land's in ag. 350 agricultural products come out of California. And here's one I bet you didn't know. 50% of the US's food comes from California. Half of the food that we eat in this country comes from California. 
As a result, we use more pesticides than any other state. In fact, we use more than the next three states combined, the next three highest. And 90% of the workers are Hispanic. Now in red, what I'm showing you, these are the top 10 counties for agriculture. So that's about 30%. These are the 10 counties that technically make us the fifth largest economy in the world. Where do you think the 30 poorest towns in California are? Most of them are right in those counties because they're the Mexican, Mexican-American, they're the Hispanic farm workers that make us the fifth largest economy in the world. And they're the ones that are getting sprayed with chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. Just a little boy who likes frogs, but now I'm thinking about things like that. Does atrazine turn on aromatase? I ask you to remember aromatase. Now, you're not going to grow eggs in your testis if you're a mammal, including a human, but aromatase and estrogen are important in breast cancer and prostate cancer. Cancer being the number one, uh, these being the number one cancers in men and women behind lung cancer associated with smoking. With regards to prostate cancer, the company published a paper showing that prostate cancer rates are 8.4 fold higher in their factory and men who work bagging atrazine. 8.4 fold. The company published that, not me. With regards to breast cancer, there's at least one study showing with a very significant p-value that women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine are more likely to get breast cancer compared to women who live in the same communities but don't use their well water for drinking. That's just a correlation, but if you look at rats, remember I already told you the company showed that testosterone goes down when you feed rats atrazine, and there's a concomitant increase in estrogen when you feed rats atrazine. They published this, not me. What's more is, in another publication, they showed the following. If you give rats atrazine, there's a significant increase in the incidence of breast cancer that's estrogen dependent. So it's only a correlation in humans, but you give rats atrazine, and they develop breast cancer. In humans, I've published two papers on this, but this is a study that they published. If you take a human cell, a human adrenal cell, that doesn't normally make aromatase or produce estrogen, and you give it atrazine, it starts making estrogen, just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in amphibians, just like we've shown in reptiles, just like we've shown in birds, just like we've shown in rats. Humans, cells, do the same thing. I went to visit them. I think their name should be spelled with an I, but that's just me. <laughs> they have a pipe that flows into the Mississippi River. 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow down the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico every year. 1.2 million pounds. The community, a large part of it looks like this. There's a tour you can go on called the Toxic Tour in San Gabriel, Louisiana. At, uh, St. Gent is not the only company there. 80% black, 80% African American. Here's why I bring that up. If you look at the top 13 cancers that you're going to get in the US, 11 of the 13, you're more likely to get if you're black if you're African-American. What's more is if you look at mortality relative to Caucasian, to white Americans, you're more likely to die, and this is corrected for economics and access to health care. If you're black, and I can show you similar data for Hispanics, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers. And here's my point. Is that a biological, ethnic, racial difference? Or is it because blacks and Hispanics, minorities, are more likely to live in and more likely to work in areas where they're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. We know now that less than 10% of cancer is genetic. So when the doctor tells you you're more likely to get cancer, breast cancer, if your sister or your aunt or your mother had it, it's not genetics. That's just saying that you've been exposed to the same crap that your sister and your mother and your aunt has been exposed to. And my issue, I'm all about Coleman for a cure. That's fine, find a cure. They asked me to give a talk once. I called it an ounce of prevention. They never invited me back. They wouldn't give me any money anyway. I don't know why they want to hear from me. But my point is, with the exception of the HeLa cells, none of the cell lines that we use in breast cancer or prostate cancer are from minorities. So even if you find a cure, it may be irrelevant to the people who are more likely to get and more likely to die from those diseases. So I'm just a little boy who likes frogs, but I'm thinking about all kinds of things like that now. One of my graduate students, and I try not to talk about my graduate students' research, most of the work that I call mine is work that I do with my undergraduates, but one of my graduate students showed that if you take a breast cancer cell and give it atrazine, it starts to express aromatase. 
just like adrenal cells, just like fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, rats. Here's why that's significant. Think about breast cancer. Does it make any sense? You get an estrogen-dependent cancer, usually after menopause, when the estrogen levels in your blood are lower than they've ever been in your life. The reason is breast cancer seems to be related to your lifetime exposure to estrogen or estrogen-like molecules. But the other reason is that even though your blood levels of estrogen are low, it turns out that these cancer cells actually make their own aromatase. They make their own estrogen, which stimulates these damaged cells to grow and eventually spread. In fact, you know how important local aromatase expression is in breast cancer? It's so important that the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole. It works by blocking aromatase and decreasing estrogen locally so the cancers don't grow out of control. Yeah, I can tell by that sound, somebody sees what I see. Does that make any sense when the number one contaminant of drinking water does exactly the opposite, turns on aromatase, increases estrogen, is associated with breast cancer and induces breast cancer in rats? Maybe this part's controversial. Because see, Novartis Oncology offers treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. So in the year 2000, the same company that was giving us 80 million pounds of atrazine was selling us a drug to block the aromatase that they were helping to turn on in the first place. So if you were living in the Midwest, taking letrozole to treat your breast cancer, how was that impacted by the atrazine in your drinking water made by the same company? I published a paper called The One-Stop Shop, Chemical Causes and Cures for Breast Cancer. <laughs> See, I thought it was funny too. Their lawyers, not so much. Wrote me all kinds of letters to my dean, I told him my daddy lives in South Carolina if you want to actually talk to him, but my dear, I got tenure. <laughs> Good luck. So I think what's happened is, I think what's happened is, my interest in this aquatic organism has taught me a lot about this aquatic organism. I would argue that one of my tadpoles trapped in development in a contaminated pond or aquaria is no different than a fetus trapped in an amniotic fluid where hormones like testosterone and estrogen and thyroid hormone, the exact same hormones that my frogs need are critical and important for their development. And we now know, not my work, but the work of others, that we are exposed to, your children will be exposed to, over 300 synthetic chemicals before you leave the womb, most of which we have no idea what they do. Studies, not mine, have shown that atrazine causes prostate and mammary cancer in rats. Other studies have shown that atrazine causes immune failure. We've shown the same thing in amphibians. Pregnant rats exposed to atrazine suffer from neural damage. The offspring do. Not my work, but others have shown it. And what I'm going to tell you about now is a work that's moved me more, I think, than in even my own. An EPA laboratory showed that if you give rats atrazine when they're pregnant, they suffer an abortion because of the hormone imbalance that the atrazine creates. Another EPA laboratory published data showing that of those rats that don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. The pups are born with the prostate of an old man. Another laboratory, EPA laboratory, showed that if those rats that don't abort, the daughters are born with impaired mammary development such that when they grow up, their offspring have retarded growth and development because they can't make enough milk. Think about that. We study, I study frogs because I'm a little boy who likes frogs. We study rats because they're supposed to be telling us something about ourselves. They're mammals. And what I'm telling you is that the EPA has shown that this rat, which never saw atrazine, was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. That rat was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think of myself as a scientist, and more importantly, when I think of myself as a person, and the idea that my little girl, who's all grown up now, the fact that <clears throat> The fact that my grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today makes me realize that I have more responsibility than just a little boy who likes frogs, who likes to do science in the lab. There's a reality. A colleague of mine showed that birth defects increase in women who get pregnant during peak atrazine contamination. That's just a correlation, but I want to show you what we're gambling with. This is a study done in Washington State where they concluded that maternal exposure to atrazine is associated with fetal gastrothesis. I had never heard of gastrothesis, and I apologize for the graphic here, but I want you to see what it is. 
It's when the intestines are born outside of the baby's body. You're more likely to have this condition if you're exposed to atrazine. Here's a study that showed that if you're exposed to atrazine, you're more likely to have a condition called coenal atresia. This is from the Center for Disease Control. Coenal atresia is when the oral and the nasal cavity don't close up and the baby's born with a hole in its face. And more relevant to my studies, here's a case control study of maternal resi residential atrazine exposure in male genital malformations. The studies show that there's very strong correlations, and I won't read all those to you, between atrazine exposure when women are carrying male children they're more likely to have hypospadias, where the urethra doesn't end all the way through the penis. They're more likely to have cryptorchidism, where the testicles don't descend into the scrotum, and they're more likely to have micropenis, where the penis doesn't grow. And this is interesting to me because we know that male genital development is dependent on early exposure to testosterone. And we know that atrazine decreases testosterone in fish, in amphibians, in reptiles, in birds, and rats, and when women are exposed to, to atrazine while carrying a male child, these testosterone-dependent features don't develop properly. It's just the correlation, but I think we have to move past. Yeah, it's the person I don't like very much. <laughs> but we have to move past by only examining effects of pesticides on adult white males. When you're pregnant, everything you eat, the placenta did not evolve was not designed to keep out the 80,000 something synthetic chemicals that we've managed to create over these last few years. You're much more vulnerable during these critical developmental stages. Even after the baby's born, you're much more vulnerable when you're still developing, you're still growing, your, your neural circuits are still forming. You're much more vulnerable. A little bit of poison to an adult is a lot of poison to a young child. The EPA knows this. Maybe this is the controversial part. The EPA says, and this is a quote to the, in the New Yorker article, a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives, and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. That's what they said about atrazine. The problem is, we live in a country where at least we're told we're all created equal. But everybody in this room, I think, knows that that's not true. Everybody in this room knows that the price for this person it's very different from the price from this pregnant woman. Everybody in here knows that the price on this person is very different from the price on this person. The price on this young child is very different than the price. And it's often those people who don't have a voice that are paying the cost and not reaping those economic benefits. Those are the reasons that a little boy who liked frogs crossed the line. My professor used to tell me, my PhD professor, don't be an advocate, he said, let the science speak for itself. And I grew up professionally thinking that way. You're supposed to do science, publish in PNAS and Nature, and places that my mom can't get access to. <laughs> Somebody else once said, though, that those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And this is a philosophy that I follow. This guy said that, by the way. <laughs> this is a quote from Syngenta's website. While I'm supposed to be letting the science speak for itself, they say that they assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect actual results. And excuse me, children and adults alike, but who says shit like that, first off? <laughs> the EPA said the following, and this was in relation to my work in 2006. They said the ultimate decision is much bigger than science and weighs in public opinion. And you know what that made me think about? That made me think about my mom. They made me think about the fact that we're rewarding each other in the ivory tower by publishing things that means nothing to 99.9% .9 of the world. That my most important publication is in a place and written in a way that my mom can't understand it, yet the EPA is waiting on my mom to have an opinion. I crossed the line for that reason. I crossed the line because people like Klaus Werner, an independent scientist in Germany, oh no, wait, he wasn't independent. He was paid by Syngenta while he was working on the EPA panel to review atrazine. I crossed the line because, and I love Obama, I voted for him twice, not in the same election. <laughs> he appointed a Monsanto VP to the FDA. So how can the science speak for itself? How can the science speak for itself? And here's my issue with GMO. Some of you recognize this, I'm sure. 90% of the seeds that we use to grow our food, the blue circles, are owned by six chemical companies. There's a conflict of interest when the chemical company is selling the seed 
and making the GMO, we're going to see more, not less, because there's an inherent economic and financial conflict of interest. So maybe, maybe that's the controversy <laughs> surrounding your speaker tonight. The controversy, I think, hit ahead when Syngenta lost a $105 million lawsuit. $105 million is nothing to Syngenta. But what was worse is all their court documents became available, including their handwritten secret notes. And that was the basis for the New Yorker article. Now, what the, what's the newspaper who published it this week? The Register. They mentioned that John Entine had written a counter to the New Yorker article in Forbes. What they didn't tell you, as has been shown in Mother Jones Magazine, is that John Enton's organization is paid for by Syngenta. I ain't pay nobody to write about me in the New Yorker. Syngenta paid for that article to be written by John Entine in the New Yorker. Some funny things came out of that article. One, <laughs> the senior manager for communications, I guess, I guess they got rid of Sherry Ford. She said, and this is one of my favorite pieces. I guess this is the controversial part, just so you know. She said, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. That's what she said to the New Yorker. Here's now the court documents that were revealed that led to the New Yorker article. See, it says privileged and confidential, filed under seal, under science. Look what their number one goal was. Discredit Hayes. <laughs> so where on earth could the New Yorker have gotten the idea that they tried to discredit me? I can't imagine. This gets even better. This gets better. Here's, this is their handwritten document. Look at his list. Pardon my language. Can I say shit again? There's a list of shit that they were planning to do to me. Family background. They crossed that one out. Investigate students. Investigate funding. School history. Consider suing. Multiple emails. And this is my favorite. Can you read that? It says, set a trap. Who the hell writes down, set a trap? You can see the secretary now. Set a trap for Tyrone. I, I, here's another list. Blog psychology. They put a star by that. They said it was risky. What they did was they hired, for tens of thousands of dollars, they hired a psychiatrist to do my psychological profile to, to see how to get to me and to see if I was crazy. Custom emails I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> What a waste of money. You ain't got to pay nobody $10,000 to find out if I'm crazy. You could ask anybody who knows Tyrone and say, oh yeah, the brother's crazy. <laughs> the, the other two things that make it funny is, what do you expect to get out of that for $10,000? Only two answers, right? No, right? One is, no, he's not crazy. You just pissed off a black guy. And see, a lot of people get those two things confused. <laughs> Maybe. The other possibility is, oh yeah, he's crazy and he's whipping your butt. There's no positive outcome. And I would say, who's crazy? I didn't write stuff like this down. They wrote it down. <laughs> Everybody knows the first page of the secret spy handbook is, you don't write it down, and if you do, you shred it and eat it and self-destruct it. You don't <laughs> take it to court and give it to a judge and say, oh, this is privileged and confidential. Don't let anybody see it. <laughs> Maybe that's controversial. Here's, here's some other funny stuff. At least they knew. See right there, they said, don't respect him. And, and, <laughs> and they said, I'm schizo and narcissistic. And, 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 oh, and if TH involved in scandal and virals will drop him, they say, I want to undo modern industry and ag. Don't disrespect him. <laughs> and they wrote it down. This part isn't so funny. Tom Steger says, this is the EPA, same guy who told me it's okay for frogs to have eggs in their testes. He said, it's an unfortunate but not uncommon for registrants to sit on data that may be considered adverse to the public's perception of their products. Science can be manipulated to serve certain agendas. All you can do is practice suspended disbelief. That's what the EPA said. That's a quote. That's also featured in the New Yorker article. Some of the things they sit on include the following. This is now, again, from Syngenta's handwritten documents. They wrote TBA, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, may be a bit more potent than atrazine. So they're admitting that atrazine does something. They wrote lower doses cause same effects. Active part of compound is chlorine degradation, same as atrazine. They went on to write an increase in mammary tumors and testicular tumors. You know what TBA is? And you know when they wrote this? TBA, terbutalazine, 
is the chemical that they sent to Europe to replace atrazine. So before they sent it, they were sitting in an office, I think the same way they were sitting around writing about letrozol, they were sitting in an office writing this down. All you can do is to practice, is practice suspended disbelief. So in Crossing the Line, I've done a number of things. I've been in a number of documentaries to try to get the word beyond the ivory, power, I, ivory tower. I got the star alongside Aaron Brockovich there. I've just completed a documentary with um, Jonathan Demi. That's, that's going to be, I'm not supposed to tell you when it's coming out. I've helped Keith Ellison write a bill uh, to ban atrazine. And, and you can write to Keith Ellison and try to get support, uh, try to provide support for that. And obviously, I try to get out and give the word, put the word out, and interact with as many people who want to become as active as I possibly can. I want to end, maybe this is the controversial part, with quotes from maybe two unlikely people. You might think they're unlikely. It's time for us as a people to start making some changes. Let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. Let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the old way wasn't working, so it's up to us to do what we got to do to survive. Who knows who said that? Tupac, there you go. So maybe that was the controversial part. I'll end with another one of my favorite artists. You can decide. Thank you very, 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 very much. Thank you. All right, so we're going to begin the, uh, is this? We're going to begin the uh, question and answer session. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Make sure that you're, uh, you're clearly identifying who you're talking to. Make sure that you're not going to be able to get collected. Pass it to the end of the aisle. There's no rush here. You can ask questions at any time. Categorize. Right. So, first practical question. Uh, this is about water quality and water health. Do over the counter water filters filter out atrazine? If not, what can one do to eliminate atrazine in drinking water um, aside from banning it or a successful class action lawsuit against Syngenta? So, let me tell you first why I don't like that question. <laughs> Brita filters will take it out. I don't get a dime for saying that. I've probably sold millions of Brita filters. If I had just had a nickel for everybody who bought a Brita filter after one of my talks. Um, but it even says on the package, removes atrazine on the Brita package. So the reasons I don't like the question are other than the fact that they don't fund me. I never asked them to. But is one, it doesn't solve the environmental problem. Two, the people who are most at risk, who are less likely to have access to information and less likely to have the resources. And even if they did, those really high levels and factory workers and field workers are from dermal across the skin and inhalation. So even if they had access to filters, it doesn't help the people who are most at risk. And it also puts the burden on us. That $105 million lawsuit was water companies suing to make Syngenta take it out at the source. And so what we can do, of course, to protect ourselves against atrazine and other chemicals personally, but we also really need to put more effort into not having it be there in the first place. But thank you for the question. I'm going to apologize in advance. It, it does not look like we'll be able to get through all of these questions. Uh, so the next question, uh, what happens to atrazine in the environment in which it was applied? Does it have a half-life? Is it always there? Does it ever go away? OK, so I'll try to be quick so we get through more of the questions. Sure. Um, it depends on who you talk to, and it depends on the environment. 
In some places, atrazine is reported to have a half-life of like eight days. In others, depending on the type of soil and whether or not it's in the aquifer, it can last for years. So France banned it over 10 years ago, and the levels that they measure in the aquifers hadn't changed. So it can be there for, oh, last time I saw that talk was probably, yeah, it had been about 10 or 15 years. So it really depends on that type of habitat and soil and things. Thank you. Can you talk about your research and findings um, and how they are being used by the broader environmental justice community across the country uh, and around the world to educate the public? Um, I've, had, I've had a lot of interactions with uh, a number of nonprofit organizations. So I know that my work has been used by Pesticide Action Network. I know that the NRDC has used some of my work. I've worked very closely with Beyond Pesticides, a number of groups, and that's only and, and a number of community groups as well, um, both for pushing policies and for raising awareness. And I've been to a number of um, what do you call them, lobbying things with with organizations as well. We are so screwed. <laughs> How do you stay so chipper? Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, to be honest, I have a really wonderful um, woman in, the li in my life, my wife of now 28 years coming up, I think. Um, I have wonderful kids, I have wonderful friends, and I really have a wonderful group of students that are like family to me. I'm, I'm still in touch with students who worked in my lab 25 years ago. Um, and it's those kinds of things, and it's, and it's having, I guess, faith is the best word for it, that if we keep working towards a better place, then we'll get there. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's the opposite of sitting around being depressed about where we are. It's looking for the best and moving forward to it. With the anti whoops and gentle black. I mean, I just put a smile on my face, too. Do you have any concerns about GMOs? Is there any relation to atrazine to genetic engineering? Mm -hmm. My biggest concern with GMOs is the one that I already brought up, that the pesticide companies own the seeds that are producing the GMOs. And, and so even if, and I'm not saying it is, even if the GMO products were safe, the thing is we're going to use more and more and more pesticides. We now not, not only have the Roundup ready, but now 2,4-D ready products are being released. And I think, to, in my opinion, at least based on the knowledge that I have, the biggest danger is pesticides and how many more pesticides we're going to use and how often now we're going to be moving towards not just monoculture, but GMO monoculture. And I think that really agriculture is going to be in trouble. I think it's a very wrong direction to go in. We're losing all of that diversity. Should going to keep a rifle and I'm at you. Oh, yeah. Keep all right. going. Um, I've got nowhere to be till Monday. <laughs> <laughs> You've got many places to be. Well, I mean, I've got I mean other than here. <laughs> so is there uh, the, the question written, and I'm going to take liberties to expand it, are bees mm -hmm. being studied? So are bees being studied in similar ways that uh, affects the, or that support or in cor any correlation with the way that your studies on amphibians and frogs uh, are affected by atrazine? Is there a correlation with bees? Uh, so I don't know of any data with bees. He said, I don't know of any data that's connected to, uh, for atrazine and bees. I do know that, that there is a number of data, a number of studies looking at um, nicotinoids, I think I'm saying that right, and bees. And the, but that's a completely different set of compounds. It's an insecticide. Um, but I do, my understanding is those data are pretty strong, that that's one of the things that's, that's um, affecting the honeybee population. But not, that I know of, not atrazine. Can a patient get tested for atrazine levels? Is it a simple test? Uh, humans, are usually they do a test from the urine to measure atrazine. I don't know... Um, I, I don't know if anybody can walk in and request that. I mean, I know that there's studies that measure atrazine in urine, but I don't know if there's a service where you can get it done. I've never heard of such a thing. If somebody else knows, yeah, I've, I've never heard of such a thing. So uh, a request. Uh, will you speak to the use of atrazine on Midwest corn in the uh, coming spring of the five states with 2,4-D? Say again? Will you speak to the use of atrazine on Midwest corn and to the coming spraying of five states with 2,4-D? Oh, I, I, I mean, in terms of how much it's going to be used or whether or not there's a shift, uh, I don't know. I know that um, atrazine was the number one selling herbicide up until about 10 years ago, and it's now number two, but it's not because we use 
less atrazine, we now use more glyphosate. And the only reason that atrazine held on as number one is because you could use it on corn. Corn is naturally resistant to atrazine. Glyphosate or Roundup was competing with atrazine, but the advantage of glyphosate is that once they develop Roundup-ready soy, they could rotate the crops and use Roundup year-round. Whereas for atrazine, if you rotated the crop from corn to soy, you couldn't use atrazine in the next year. So I think what's going to happen is with 2,4-D-ready corn and other crops coming online, probably 2,4-D will start to outcompete atrazine because we have the seed and we have the pesticide that goes with the seed. But that's my, I, I, I'm not an expert on the markets and, and where that will move. Quote, <laughs> we can assume that the CEOs making atrazine are greedy, but more to the point, are they delusional or psychopathic? I, you know, I, I often wonder, and many of the people I've interacted with, I, you know, I don't want to be self-righteous, but I often wonder how any person with a conscience can do some of the things that I've witnessed. Because, I mean, even if I didn't like you, I just picked on you, I don't know, because you're sitting in front of me, I wouldn't actively go out of my way to be harmful to you. I, I would just ignore you. I mean, so I, I can't understand, like, the things that they have written in their notes. I can't understand how people, I can't understand how people can write TBA may be more potent than atrazine and then go home to their kids and to their wives and to their families. So, um, and I know that there are people, I mean, I worked with these guys. I know, and, and there are two classes. There's some of them are just dumb and, and will let people tell them, oh, you know, tell them anything. And, and sorry, I realized that was rude, but I can't think of a nicer way to say it. And, and some of them are just, I, I, don't even, I can't even think of a word for it. I mean, they will look in your face and say things that aren't true, amoral. I, but anyway, I, I don't want to sound self-righteous. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, atrazine and Agent Orange, do they act in similar manners? Do, uh, are studies done by the VA, do they to contribute to any of that information? Or are they no better than the chemical industry, the VA? I, you know, I don't know. I know that uh, 2,4-D was one of the components of Agent Orange. I don't know the mechanism of action for how T4-D works on plants. Um, and I don't think there's enough studies out there to really look at the effects on non-target organisms. You may not know, uh, but to what extent does the work of Swedish oncologist Dr. Robert with the natural step support your goals? I'm not familiar with that work. Where can I go for get more information about pesticides and related issues? Uh, there's, there, oh, there's a couple of places, Pesticide Action Network. Um, do you want to do, do write the website on the border? I have it. Oh, okay. Uh, that, that's where I go. <laughs> I mean, there are a number of other websites, but I um, have used the website extensively. And there you go. The rest of these are so close to questions that have already been answered. Uh, yeah. So that, that's the questions that I have. Um, sure. Round two. <laughs> <laughs> system. Okay. Um, I'm also going to take a little bit of liberty with this question as well. So my Indiana well water, and we can also include other water that mm -hmm. might have been. My Indiana water tested without atrazine, but atrazine was used on fields for 15 years. What is the best test to use on well water? I would guess that that test failed because it's hard, even if you're not using atrazine, it's hard to find any water in the Midwest that doesn't have atrazine in it. So it would depend on the detection, the, the detection level. Um, it, maybe it's a home kit that doesn't have a, a low detection level. but I'd, Hmm? Really? I'd, I'd be really surprised if that were true. Really surprised. I mean, most of it, and we've now sampled, for example, and the U.S. Geological Survey did our sampling. We've sampled all over the U.S., and it's really hard to find a place that doesn't have atrazine. Even in counties, for example, in Nebraska, where they don't grow corn. Like, there's a county called, um, I forget now, but it's the Prairie Sand Dunes. Has as much atrazine as any other place in, in Nebraska. So I'd, I'd be very surprised. Or maybe you're really lucky. Yeah. It has to be. Because it, it is just so hard to find anything that doesn't have atrazine in it. We have pesticides in our watershed. I want to be 
you know, I'm unclear who the we is. I mean, let's assume uh, Oregon, and let's maybe assume Lane County, and maybe let's assume the Sayus Law watershed. Um, should we press for our water and air testing or just assume uncertainty? I would. I know in some places, I know, for example, uh, where I live in Oakland, we get a report, I think, annually, and, and they test for a number of different things. In some states, I know you can request for tests, and other places there's a charge for it. I don't know what the rule is here, and it might vary with county. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the water in California, the water where I'm at is, at least, I mean, that's assuming that the laboratories are testing properly, uh, the water where I'm at is not problematic, where I live in Oakland, in our watershed. Well, as I, yes, as I said, that's assuming that the tests are done properly. I know, you know, I was going to say something that's not true. I know that the water in a laboratory that we use does not have atrazine, but that's double filtered. That's ultra filtered water. Um, and there's not a lot of atrazine use in California, at least not where we're at. It's mostly up in Northern California where, the, um, where it's used in forestry. Glyphosate, I mean, even on our campus, they're applying glyphosate, and, and we and several others have complained. Yeah, it might be that they're using a, a detection limit that's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, when I had it done for my research, it, it was really expensive. It was like probably my biggest expense in doing that research. It was, you know, I don't want to exaggerate, but I want to say it was like, I, I, I won't, but it was a big number. Not that I know of. Glyphosate works by a very, well, it works at plants by a very different mechanism. I, I don't know of um, any impacts on aromatase. The, the, the pesticides that really do affect steroid hormones synthesis are usually the fungicides. The fungicides are all, some of them knock, knock them down, some of them increase it. Um, so atrazine's, well, I don't want to say it's unique. But a lot of people haven't looked for a lot of other chemicals, but the fungicides tend to be uh, big in terms of affecting hormone production. So I have three more note cards, which means we'll probably get through them, and then we can open up again to more uh, fluid Good. conversation, question and answer. Uh, what about the breakdown products of atrazine? For mm -hmm. example, I know that the breakdown products of 2,4-D is worse than actual 2,4-D. Mm -hmm. There are at least two other degradation products from atrazine that are as active as atrazine. And, and, and I think once you remove the chlorine group, it becomes inactive. But there are two active, at least two active metabolites Again, I don't know about 2,4-D, but I know, for example, the same is true of DDT. Its breakdown products are equal. I don't want to say equally act. They do different things than the parent compound. But with atrazine, two of the breakdown products do exactly the same thing in terms of inducing aromatase. And, and by the way, I should say, atrazine does more than induce aromatase. That just seems to be the mechanism that's most pertinent to our area of research. It affects a lot of other hormones through a lot of other different mechanisms that we and others have published on. Uh, I can answer this one. Is this presentation being filmed? And if so, how will it be archived? Yes, it will be available in probably two spaces. One will be through Beyond Toxics website, and the other one will probably be through the Environmental Studies uh, website. So that will become filmed, and it will be made available on the interweb. Would you speak briefly, or not, <laughs> if you prefer not to, about corporate influences on science research and the, quote, taking over of universities and government regulating industries? Oh, gosh, that's hard to, that's hard to speak <laughs> Just briefly, briefly. on. Um, I, I am certainly not the only one working in this area or in other areas who has been harassed. Mine may be a bit more uh, dramatic, but I know I have many, many colleagues, many of whom advised me on how to deal with Syngenta and how to, uh, to maintain. Um, and even on my own uh, campus, there was, you guys might know, Ignacio Chapella, who did some work for Novartis and who essentially had his career almost completely ruined, but certainly went through years of hell suing for his tenure. And one of the things that happens, and that actually happens on my campus too, if you get sort of a reputation for, you know, like with this big company from Syngenta, then, then you're viewed as somebody who's going to uh, 
um, block money from coming into the campus. And so all jokes aside about getting tenure, there are ways that the university can really make your life difficult. Um, I could go on, but um, just setting policies and denying you access to things that hinder your research. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, is atrazine transferred into food or cells of food? To my knowledge, atrazine is not in, like it's not in your corn. It's water soluble, so it's mostly in the water. I have seen one reference to atrazine in milk. So it, it can go across potentially in cow's milk. Um, but I don't know, do you know of any? Yeah, I don't know if food I think is not the problem. That's other chemicals, that's not true, right? There's some that can be on the surface of fruit and things, for example, and there's some that can actually be inside so you can't wash it off. But atrazine is not a problem in food to my knowledge. It's uh, drinking water or if you're breathing in, in, in the workplace, like if you work in the factory. So we are through with our cards, so let's, now let's uh, go with the question and answer. We have a question here, and then it looks like one up in the corner, and then we'll come here. Um, so is by aerial applications. For Um, so one, you don't have to spray atrazine early to have it be in the rain. So that probably, yes, I agree that probably makes it worse. But there's um, uh, studies showing that atrazine goes up on dust and can travel in the clouds. So there are researchers who measure atrazine in the clouds and it can come down in the rainwater. And if it come down in the rainwater, I think it levels that as high as 10, I want to say, which is you know, 100 times higher than we're using in the laboratory. Um, and the estimates I've seen from US Geological Survey are that a half million pounds of atrazine come down in the rainwater every year. So, and so it doesn't have to be airily sprayed. Air, the right way. Spraying it airily probably makes it worse. Um, in terms of the amount in your urine, I think if you're an adult, the biggest risk is if it's constantly in your body. Um, the reason that I think, for example, fetuses and tadpoles are, are more at risk is because you can filter the atrazine out from your kidneys and urinate it out. But if you're a fetus in amniotic fluid, of course, you're urinating into the fluid that you live in. Same case with a tadpole or with a fish. So if it's a, a brief one-time exposure for an adult male, I would guess it's, my guess is it's not that bad. If it's a long-term, prolonged, repeated exposure, um, that's when I think you see the problems. And that's when I think you see problems associated with the adverse health outcomes. The danger of, 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 of the sort of mechanism, the way that chemicals like atrazine and other endocrine disruptors work, the danger is that you're not going to drink it and then walk out and get sick tonight. But repeated low-level exposure will, as we saw in the rats, will increase your likelihood of developing things like prostate cancer and breast cancer later in life. That makes it more difficult to diagnose. That makes it more difficult to litigate. So for example, I know there was a big lawsuit in the San Gabriel um, factory. I'm not sure actually what, what happened to that. But it makes it much more difficult because you don't have the evidence. Right? You're talking about something that happened when you were you know, for example, getting breast cancer when you're 40 might have had to do with your, like the DES model, right? It's not like the, the daughters of women who took DES came out sick or deformed, but at age 30 or 40 or even 20 sometimes, and other problems pop up as a result of that in utero exposure. So we have a question up here, and then we'll go here, and then we'll go here. Up in the corner, yep. You showed the Einstein quote earlier, and you were talking about how you see yourself as um, a scientist and an activist. Do you think that has a large part to do because of your relationship with Syngenta, or is that how you always um, view yourself? I, you know, I, I like to think of myself as somebody who grows and finds something positive from, from everything. And, and I think if, if I, I don't know if I want to give them the power, but I think that my interactions and my relationship with Syngenta probably made me a better scientist. I mean, you, gotta, you better believe the dots, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and we keep track of everything in, 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 a, in a very careful manner. So I think I can give them that. They made me stronger that way. But I think they also made me realize, um, as I said here, that I'm more than just a little boy who likes frogs, but I have a sense of responsibility. 
And, and I think having had that experience with them was different than, for example, hearing it from other scientists who said, you know, I've been harassed and I've been doing this and that. But actually having those things happen, and for me, actually, too, seeing written down that there was somebody in a room plotting to do things to me made me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility. Other than that, I can say, you know, I always cared about the environment and I always, you know, I wanted the forest to be around and those kinds of things. But I don't think I ever thought of myself as somebody who, you know, was concerned for public health and concerned. I mean, not, you know, not that I was a misanthrope or anything like that, but just never thought of myself as somebody who would be politically active, who would say things like, write to your congressperson. I mean, yeah. So we had a question here. You know, um, I'm not as familiar with the work. I know that it was, that's the work that's been republished now, is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just not, it's not an area where, where I'm a, an expert. Um, I, know that, I know that that's unprecedented, that a journal would retract something and another journal would pick it up. And I think the fact that the other journals picked it up with peer review um, well, first off, I would say that the journal that published it in the first place after peer review um, should probably stick by its decision because nothing changed between that publication and that, right? And because you can criticize anything. Yeah, I mean, and, and you, I mean, you can criticize my work's not perfect, so it can still be published and be criticized. To retract it means something very different. It means it should have never been, you know. So then, then have another journal pick it up knowing that and have it peer reviewed, I think, really says a lot for the work. Um, but just like my work, it's not done. There's still other things that need to be done um, as follow-up. And you know, the same is true with my work. Um, is that used in other industries beyond agriculture? So that you might have other sources of exposure? It's agriculture and forestry. Uh, in some places, it's used on golf courses. And in some states, but not all, you can actually buy it for lawn use. But as far as I know, that's it. Oh. Sorry, this is, this is not even funny. In Australia, they use atrazine or simazine, a similar compound, to keep algae down in swimming pools. So you literally, so you literally have kids swimming in atrazine. But that's, that's not true in the US. Though. I only know of, of Australia doing that. We probably have time for one or two. Let's go here and then there. Um, sorry, in the back, I'm sorry. Can you say the date of the issue of the New Yorker article oh, you referred to? Uh, February. Oh, February 10th. There you go. February 10th. Of this year? Yes. yes. Thank you. Is that right? 10th. Yeah. Is it online? Yeah. Yes. You, I think it got something like 50,000 shares or something on Facebook. It's primarily corn, but it's also used on sugarcane. That's the big, uh, big use in Australia. Um, it's also used, and, and that's in Florida also, it's used on sugarcane fairly extensively. It's used on Christmas tree farms. Um, it's used on, uh, what do you call it, turf farms, where they're growing the grass that they roll up to the, the sod, is that what it's called? Um, I think sorghum. And, I mean, it's a monocot, mostly used on monocot crops. Corn, corn by far is the biggest. I don't want to make a number up, but an ag, like 90% of the use in the U.S. is corn. I'm making that number up, but it's a big number. Forestry? And, well, in forestry, I, I thought she asked about crops. But forest, for, the difference is in forestry, you use a lot of it, and, and you know, then you don't use it for a little, in one spot. So it's a, it's a very different type of, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's better or worse, but it's a different type of application. <laughs> Keith Ellison. Okay. So Keith Ellison, they were trying to ban atrazine in Minnesota. I worked with a number of uh, legislators there, and then Keith Ellison was elected to U.S. Congress from Minnesota. So it is a bill uh, um, in, the, in U.S. Congress. It was on New York's radar. Uh, Minnesota tried for several years. I worked with them quite a bit. Wisconsin uh, is banned in many counties, so they ban it by county if it's detected in the water. Um, Illinois started to try, but they had such a strong hold in Illinois, it didn't go anywhere. Tasmania has worked, not, not one of the U.S. states, but Tasmania has worked very hard to get rid of atrazine and simazine. Um, and that's it that I know of. Uh, 
other than the, other than the European Union, and Angola for some reason is banned activism. I mean, a country has the longest standing civil war in Africa, but somehow they could agree that they don't want atrazine. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> so let's take our last question here. Mm-hmm. For atrazine, I don't know. Is, would you consider atrazine to be a top? Yes. Oh, it's, yeah, it's been measured there. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm sure it can get there. But, but whether or not it, um, anybody's looked at people there, I don't know. So that is unfortunately our time. Let's once again thank Professor Hayes. Thank you.